At this time, I would like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Lisa Gall. Lisa has over 30 years of experience in healthcare, quality, and clinical informatics as a nurse and nurse practitioner across multiple settings. As clinical program manager at Stratus Health, Lisa provides support for the CMS Quality Payment Program, leads QPP support for small, underserved, and rural settings in Minnesota, and is involved with the Transforming Clinical Practices Initiative. Lisa sits on the Minnesota eHealth Work Group and the CMS Technical Expert Panel for the Quality Measures Development Plan. She has published, taught, and presented on various health IT topics and is lead developer of the Stratus Health MIPS Estimator. Now I will turn it over to Lisa. Hello everyone, thanks for joining the webinar on the Quality Payment Program and what rural clinicians and critical access hospitals need to know. We have a lot of content to cover today. I have a couple of stops for Q&A sessions, um, but we'll um, move along fairly quickly. Um, so um, some of the slides will the slides will be available to you in the future. So if we go too fast through the slides, you will have access to them in the future. I have no disclosures to uh, claim, and a disclaimer is that the content in this presentation is based on latest information available by CMS and is subject to change as CMS policies change. So we do encourage you to review specific statutes and regulations. Most of the content was taken from the CMS website, the final rule, and the year two final rule slides. I work at Stratus Health, which is independent nonprofit Minnesota-based organization founded in uh, 1971. Um, we lead collaboration and innovation in healthcare quality and safety and are trusted experts in facilitating improvement for people and communities. We work at the intersection of research policy and practice and are part of um, the Lake Superior Quality and Innovation Network. Um, today, we'll, um, the objectives for the session is to understand the basics of the quality payment program who is eligible to participate in um, 2017 and beyond, which quality measures and improvement activities might apply to rural health providers and critical access hospitals, and estimating how your MIP score can help you set improvement goals going forward. The overview of the quality payment program is um, this, the quality payment program was derived from the MACRA Act of 2015, Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. Um, there are two paths in um, the quality payment program. The MIPS path, uh, merit-based incentive payment system, which is performance-based payment adjustment based on what you are reporting in, um, in different categories. And um, the second path is advanced APMs, or alternative payment models, which provide incentive payments for sufficiently participating in an innovative payment model. CMS, um, in the year two final rule, which was released in November of 2017 um, for 2018, considered um, these, these issues um, that they have heard back from clinicians and organizations. They really want to focus on improving beneficiary outcomes, reducing burden on clinicians, and increasing the adoption of advanced APMs. Um, they want improving data and information sharing. We want to ensure the operation excellence in program implementation, maximize participation in the program, and deliver IT systems capable of that meet capabilities that meet the needs of the users. Just a recap of who's eligible for MIPS reporting in the path one of the um, program. There's no change in the types of clinicians eligible to participate in 2018. It remains the same as last year. So we have physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, clinical nurse specialists, and CRNAs. Physicians are defined below, and um, there are some uh, limitations of doctors of chiropractic in, depending on the state they practice. So the MIPS eligible clinicians, um, eligible clinician types um, 
had a low volume threshold that if they were below any of these volumes um, of Medicare Part B billable and allowed charges, um, they were exempt from MIPS reporting. So in 2017, that was $30,000 of Medicare Part B or one and more than 100 beneficiaries. In 2018, that amount moved up to $90,000 in Medicare Part B and providing care to over 200 beneficiaries. And these are Medicare Part B physician charges, pro fees, not um, facility fees. Of course, um, clinicians who are below those um, levels may voluntarily report uh, and also those who, who clinicians who are exempt from MIPS in the past and had to report to PTRS can also voluntarily report. Of course, they will not receive payment adjustments. So the basic exemption on those MIPS eligible clinicians, if you are um, above those thresholds, there are still exemptions. So the criteria are those who who are first years, um, the first year they are enrolled in Medicare billing um, for the first calendar year. The second um, exemption is if you are significantly participating in an advanced APM, and that advanced APM um, needs to meet certain criteria of either payments paid or beneficiaries seen through your advanced APM under Medicare Part B. And uh, the, the third is a little different different than the first two because the first two are um, exemptions at the MPI and TIN level, and that TIN is a um, tax ID number. Um, the third one is assessed at both an individual and a group level. So the determination at the TIN and MPI is for individuals and at the group TIN for groups. So groups who go above that um, 90,000 or 200 visits and report as a group um, are above the threshold, so must report. I should say they have the choice of reporting. Um, those clinicians who are um, eligible at the individual level um, must report, but if you choose to report as a group, then you include all of your eligible clinicians, even if they are below, because they assess the, the volume at the 90,000 or 200 visits. In year two, the special status um, equals special scoring, as in year one. Um, so the, that special scoring can affect you in the improvement activity category and in the advancing care information category. There is no change um, to the non-patient facing criteria for individuals who have um, less than 100 patient facing encounters during the determination period or groups who have more than 75% of their clinicians in the group are non-patient facing. There is no change to special status for um, 15 or uh, small clinics, 15 or less clinicians, or rural or health um, professional shortage areas. The groups, um, if there are more than 75% of the NPI's billing under the individual clinician or group's TIN who meet that status are also avail, um, eligible for special status scoring. Reporting options under MIPS um, is that you can report either as an individual or um, as a group, or as new this year as a virtual group. So we'll talk about the individuals um, that is related to the NPI, National Provider Identifier Number, and TIN number, Taxpayer ID number, where the benefits are reassigned to a TIN. So an individual may belong to several um, tax ID numbers, and so they would need to check their eligibility in every practice that they are participating in. As a group, a group is considered two or more. Um, Clinicians who have reassigned, reassigned their billing rights to a single tax ID number and as an alternative payment model entity, um, those who are in APMs must report as a group. So virtual groups can be formed by a solo practitioner um, or 10 or less eligible clinicians who come together virtually. Um, 
no matter what specialty or location they're in, to participate in MIPS for a performance year. And if you do participate as a group in MIPS, you are assessed as a group across all four MIPS categories. There are two paths for MIPS. I'm going to cover the first path, which is advanced alternative payment models. This is the advanced APMs. So first, we'll talk about alternative payment models. They are described as new models of paying for healthcare that incentivize quality and value over the volume by moving away from the Medicare fee-for-service um, system. Advanced APMs um, are subsets of advanced of APMs that receive straight across the board a 5% bonus payment if the eligible clinicians in that APM meet the threshold to become qualified professionals. And they either do that as a group together or not as a group. So the whole entity that is in an advanced APM is either qualified professionals or non. In order to be an advanced APM, they, um, organizations or entities need to meet three requirements. They must use um, certified EHR technology in uh, greater than 50% um, of their participants. The payment for covered service is based on quality measures comparable to MIPS. And the entity is either a medical home model or it requires the participants to bear more than a nominal amount of financial risk. So that means they, need to, they have a downside payment in addition to an upside payment um, with a shared risk both up and downside. So if you are in an advanced APM and you're qualified, you don't have qualified participants, you didn't meet that threshold of 20% of the um, Medicare beneficiaries bills or 25% of the Medicare bills, then your entity becomes a MIPS alternative payment model. And then they are MIPS eligible clinicians, even though they're still in an alternative payment model. So then they're just in that special scoring for MIPS eligible clinicians as a MIPS APM. And on the far left, you have the MIPS eligible clinicians who are not in either a MIPS APM or an advanced APM, but just are reporting to the MIPS, uh, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. So an example would be eligible clinicians in advanced APMs um, don't meet thresholds. Um, or a MIPS APM could be MSSP Track 1, and that's the Medicare Shared Savings Program Track 1, which has an upside risk but no downside risk. Any questions at this point on APMs? I don't see any questions in the chat box yet. Okay. We'll continue forward. If you think of something, you can certainly add it. The second path of um, the quality payment program is MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. As I talked about categories, um, maybe I should have shown this slide first, but you probably are mostly aware that there are four categories to MIPS. Quality, improvement activities, advancing care information, and cost. And uh, the four MIPS categories compile a MIPS final score that's worth up to 100 points. How that's divvied out is that in 2017, 60% of your quality was um, counted for um, your total MIPS score, 15% of improvement activities, 25% of ACI, and none of the cost was um, attributed to your MIPS score in 2017. In 2018, that changes a little bit. They will be including a 10% cost factor, and the quality factor goes down to 50% rather than 60%. So I'll talk a little, about, bit, a little bit about each of these categories. The advancing care information, previously meaningful use, or use of certified EHR technology. You actually get, um, it accounts for 25% of the MIP score in um, 2018 and as it did in 2017. So there's no change in that. You can earn up to 100 points, but there are actually uh, 155 possible points, and that accounts for 25 total MIPS points. 
And in 2018, the things that are in blue when I go through these slides have been changed in 2018. So if you're looking for something that's been changed, it's in blue on these slides. You can use either the 2014 or 2015 certified EHR or a combination. But if you use the 20, only 2015 certified EHR, you get a 10% bonus in 2018. And that's for the whole um, reporting period. The base score is required for any score in the advanced in care information category is worth 50 points of the 100. And that uh, there are four measures required for 2014 CERT and five for 2015 CERT. And CERT is Certified EHR Technology. There are some exclusions for a couple of base, base measures for e-prescribing and health information exchange or sending summary of care that has um, applied to both the 2017 and 2018 um, uh, performance. So the performance um, measures are optional. You can earn up to 90 points, um, seven in, for 2014 CERT and nine available for 2015 CERT. And bonus points are available in advancing care information. Um, you can earn up to 15% um, bonus points in 2017 and 25% of your bonus points in 2018. And they're listed below on your bonus points. I won't go into detail in them, um, but you can take a look at them. I mentioned a couple of them. The other one is reporting to public health clinical registry as a 10% bonus and any additional public, public health or clinical registry reporting an additional 5% bonus. And if you remember back in meaningful use, those were um, things that were used to be required in meaningful use. So when are those category points reweighted to quality? So if you are specific types of um, clinicians will automatically get their um, ACI points reweighted to quality unless you report to that category. And that includes the, uh, the nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, anesthetists, and PAs. And also some special status clinicians um, who are non-patient facing, um, seeing less than um, 100, I'm sorry, that should, it shows greater than, but that should be a less than 100 Medicare Part B patient encounters. And then those who are hospital-based, who are, have over 75% of their encounters in hospital settings, and that includes inpatient, on-campus, outpatient hospital, or, or ED. And then in 2018, the final rule that was um, released in November, They've included now um, eligible clinicians, um, including to be reweighted for their ACI as off-campus outpatient hospitals and ambulatory surgical centers. And then if you are a group with more than 75% of the clinicians meeting that special status, you can have your ACI category reweighted to quality. That's not always beneficial, so I'd really caution you if it gets reweighted to quality and your quality score is lower. Um, then you may not be benefiting by reweighting to ACI category, your ACI category to quality. So it is um, another um, set of um, clinicians who are not automatically reweighted to quality but eligible and must apply for a hardship exception are those clinic clinicians who are working in small practices. If your EHR was decertified, you have a significant hardship exception. And in that one, the five-year limit was removed. And also, the, what was added in um, is the CMS designated natural disasters. Um, that list of counties is on the CMS website, QPP. Um, and those are FEMA designated. So I'll talk a little about the difference between 2014 third and 2015 CERT. These are the seven, um, uh, the four base measures. Um, the security risk analysis is a must-do on both. The e-prescribing is a must-do on both, and you must have at least one in the um, uh, numerator. Sending summary of care is a must, uh, and uh, must have at least one in the numerator. 
and providing patient access is a must in order to do all four of these and all five of these on the right to provide patient access um, and also requesting accepting a summary of care for the 2015 CERT. So those are the five and the four um, base measures that are required to get 50 points. There are exclusions, as I mentioned, uh, for e-prescribing and sending summary of care, in that if you have less than 100 prescriptions written during the performance or sent less than 100 transitions of care sent out from your facility during the performance area um, period. So on to the quality category. Um, that is now um, in 2018 uh, accounts for 50% of your MIPS score, but it earns you 60 category points. So it, you, you take this um, as a multiplication, 60 points times 0.5 is, you know, whatever your score is, so out of 60. So you report up to six quality measures. There are approximately 277 measures. Um, you can pick from a specialty set if you are a specialist. And either method must include at least one outcome or one or a high priority measure if an outcome measure is not available. You can earn between three to 10 category points for measures without benchmarks in 2017. Um, and in 2018, they are capping um, those measures that are topped out at seven points. Um, if they're topped out for two or more years, then um, you will only earn a maximum of seven points for those measures. And then the data completeness criteria has increased in 2018 to 60%, which means you need to have at least um, 20 patients and meet um, have at least 50% um, of your Medicare billed services included in your reporting, and in 2018, it's 60%. So you earn one point in 2018. In 2017, you were earning three points. In 2018, you only earn one point if your data completeness is not met. However, small practices under size 15 can still earn three points. You do get bonus points for um, additional um, outcome or high priority measures or reporting end-to-end um, -end electronically without manual input. So the quality category um, has also um, has what's new is scoring improvement bonus worth up to 10 percentage points. So if you had a, a 10 percentage improvement in your category score from 2017 to 2018, you will get um, a 10 percentage point bonus in your MIPS score. So the MIPS reporting methods are through claims, EHR registry, and qualified clinical data registry, or QCDR. Each of those reporting methods has different benchmarks. Um, and I'll show those to you in a minute because it really matters what your benchmarks are and how you perform. It's not a true performance that you get a score. It's how the benchmarks are laid out. The option for large groups of 25 or plus or more is CMS Web Interface. They report on 14 standard and static quality measures. And the APMs report collectively as an entity across all tax ID numbers in that group. So in 2017, these quality measures um, by submission methods were available. So claims had about 74, EHR 53, registry had a lot more at 243 MIPS measures available, um, and the QCDR benchmarks are um, right now um, on the fly. Some of them have benchmarks, but as they um, get more data, those benchmarks will be um, built on the fly this year. So we don't have benchmarks for a lot of them. So basically, if you try to estimate your score, you'll only get three points if there are no benchmarks. Um, the CMS web interface, as I said, has 14 static me me measures. This year, um, the final um, rule changes, there are going to be, it says nine here, but when I looked in the final rule, they did not approve one of those. So it's only eight new, three removed, and 12 with substantive changes 
and 27 were removed from specialty sets that were kind of restrictive for specialists. And when talking about specialty measure sets, all these, there's 35 specialty measure sets that you can um, you know, look at to see. Some of these, um, I didn't write how many each of them, each of the specialties, how many measures were applicable because this has changed this year. They removed so many of them. Um, but the blue, um, the ones in blue are new specialty sets that are available in 2018. Um, so when you look on the qpp.cmf.gov website and go to the quality measures, you look at the specialty measure sets and you are able to pick from uh, a specialty set. Let's say that you're um, an ophthalmologist and that um, um, there are only four, let's say there are only four measures for ophthalmology, um, that then your denominator for that um, specialty set is only 40 rather than 60. Remember, otherwise you're reporting six measure sets. So if you're choosing a specialty measure set, it's uh, um, determined by the number of measures that are available for that specialty. So here's how you look up your quality measures on the CMS website. And this is at qpp.cms.gov. And then you just go under MIPS quality measures. And you, do a, um, you choose um, what you're looking for. If you're looking under a certain data submission method, and let's say you only have EHR, submission method available, then um, you choose that. Otherwise, you just pick your specialty measure set and leave your data submission method alone. Uh, if you choose your specialty measure set, um, uh, then these are all the specialists that are available for 2017. And um, you click one of those, and it will show you then what data submission, um, uh, what measures are available for each of those specialists. As I mentioned earlier, different benchmarks for di create different quality scores for each reporting method. When, when you look at DESI at the breast cancer screening, I used example 112 breast cancer screening. Under claims, if I, um, my performance was 48%, I fall under DESI 4, so I'll get somewhere between 4 and 5 points if I use claims. However, if I use EHR, I will get um, earn seven plus points for that measure because the decile falls higher. If I'm reporting using registry, I'm only going to be in the sixth decile, so my score will be between six and seven. And ACO, um, CMS Web Interface, has a whole different scoring mechanism, so I would be under the 50th percentile for um, CMS Web Interface. And um, again, to score more than three points for a measure, you need to have a benchmark for the measure. You have to have a minimum case size of 20. You meet the data completeness. And the data completeness for claims is more than 50% of uh, Part B claims. And QCDR registry and EHR is more than 50% of all payers, not just CMS claims. And under web interface, they just take the first 243 claims for that measure for the year. Questions? Break for questions if anyone has any. I don't see any questions at this time. OK. Give it a. Minnesota Minute here, and uh, we'll move forward if no one has any questions. We have a lot to cover, so I don't mean to shut you off quickly here, and um, we'll get through it, and maybe there will be more questions at the end. So the next category in MIPS is the Improvement Activities category, which counts for 15% of your MIPS total score. In, within the category, you have 40 points, and what Improvement activities do is help you transition to medical home models and alternative payment models. There are about 20 additional activities available in 2018, and some of them, uh, old ones, have changed a bit. Um, so what 
they are, in order to get full scores for this, you need to engage in up to four activities for at least 90 days. They are rated at medium activities or high activities uh, worth 10 or 20 points. And you can earn category bonus points in the ACI category for using your certified EHR for some of the activities. This um, category is reported by simple yes-no attestation that yes, you did the activity, no, you did not, or basically yes, <laughs> if you did it, otherwise you wouldn't be saying no. Um, there are special scoring, there is special scoring available for those who are um, eligible clinicians that are in um, primary care uh, patient-centered medical homes, MSSP, or next generation APMs. You will those in other advanced, um, I'm sorry, alternative payment models will get receive half credit, and then double points for clinicians in small or rural settings. So if you have one high activity worth 20 points, in a, and you work in a small or rural setting, you will have reached your 40 points. So one high activity will get you maximum points in this category or two medium activities. Again, you can search your improvement activities on the CMS uh, website, and you just look at what you what category or subcategory you want to look for. Um, you can search also by name of the improvement activities, or look at the list available on the CMS website. One, a couple of examples here: a consultation of the prescription drug monitoring program, and care coordination agreements that promote. Improvements in patient tracking across settings. So the, the first one is a high-weighted activity. The second one is a medium-weighted activity. Um, I kind of like this behavioral health example because I think a lot of primary care providers are also incorporating mental health services in um, their clinics. And so if you co-locate primary care and mental health, it's um, worth 20 points. And if you've implemented a, a primary a patient centered behavioral health model, that's worth 20 points. So the points here are on the left, um, the eligible for um, CERT bonus. Some of these are eligible if you use your EHR to, um, to um, do that activity. There are um, details and audit guidance. Um, there's very specific guidance on what you should um, keep for documentation because this is an attestation. So there, this is available on the QPP website. Cost category um, was not included in 2017, but is now in 2018 worth 10% of your MIPS score. So the two measures scored are averaged or if you have only one, just one of those, if, if you only have one of them. This category score, um, it, uh, the two categories are Medicare spending per beneficiary and the total per capita, per capita cost measures. This category weight will increase um, to 30 per, up to 30% of your MIP score by 2021. There is no data submission required. It's calculated from claims. Um, it's calculated using your current year's performance, so you will not know or even uh, guess your um, cost score unless you have a uh, QRUR from previous years that you think you'll be pretty much the similar score on. And there is an improvement, um, scoring improvement bonus up to a percentage point based on year-to-year um, -year improvements in cost. So how do you score um, and, and um, report to MIPS? In, in 2017, we had the option to part, uh, pick, and pick your pace. Don't participate, submit something, submit a partial year or submit a full year. That is not an option in 2018. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one because I want to focus a little more on the 2018 um, transition year um, comparison. So before, um, in last year, you only needed 90 days minimum for quality, up to 12 months. In 2018, you need a complete 12 months across the board for all quality um, reporting. So in 
cost that was not included last year is now a 12-month reporting. So cost and quality are 12-month reporting. Um, and then improvement activities and advancing care information, you can use any time between a 90 to 365 days for both those categories, improvement and ACI. So a little explanation on virtual groups. The practitioners in groups of 10 or less come together virtually to participate as a group. And you must elect to do this before the beginning of the performance year. So that has ended for 2018. Uh, ended December 20, uh, 31st, 2017. And you cannot change your election after the performance period starts. I'm going to explain the MIPS transition year scoring, which was 0 to 100 points. Um, in the zero do nothing category, you got zero points and were, will be, if you did nothing or do nothing for 2017, you'll be assigned a negative 4% payment adjustment to all Medicare Part B uh, physician fee service claims. Um, if you um, got three points right on the nose by reporting one quality measure for one patient for one day, um, through a claims process, then you have a neutral payment adjustment. However, if you earn anything between 4 to 69 points, it's a pretty wide range, then you're on a little bit of a sliding scale on the losers, the ones on the low end, or those who are negative pay payment adjusted, will pay those who score higher in this scale. This first year of 20, the first year of 2017, they don't anticipate this will be very, very significant because it is, they've made it pretty easy to, for people to avoid negative payment adjustment. Um, so when you get to, into the 70 or above points, you, you get a, both a positive payment adjustment plus an exceptional care bonus payment. So um, you're going to get a little more of that, that pull from the zero to 70, uh, zero to three points. Um, but you're also going to get a, an exceptional care bonus payment, um, which has been allocated $500 million to um, clinicians across the U.S. Um, to um, encourage higher performance in MIPS. So it is, a, it is worth checking your MIPS score to see where you fall um, and whether you are um, at the top end of this green or the bottom end of the green. Obviously, those who are nearer to 100 get higher bonus payments and um, incentive payments. In 2018, for this year, they've changed this scale a bit. So those who, and also they've changed the negative payment adjustment to 5% payment. So those scoring 0 to 3.75 will get a negative 5% payment adjustment if you've earned less than 3.75 points. If you're earning 3.76 to 14, you get a negative payment adjustment, but it's less than 5% and less but uh, greater than 5%, but less than zero. If you earn 15 points on the nose, then you have a neutral payment adjustment, 15.99 to um, <clears throat> 69.99 is a positive payment adjustment. Um, there is no exceptional care bonus um, payments there, but when you get into 70 to 100, um, again, same, same criteria. There are new bonuses in 2018 for, that will be added to your final MIPS score for complex patients and for small practices. So um, they're going to be using um, percentage of dual eligibles and an HCC risk score. This um, facility-based measurement is probably of concern to hospitals. Um, it was an option that they considered, but they um, delayed it until year three. This is a facility-based measurement option that converts your hospital total performance score into a MIPS quality and cost performance scores and uses data of this facility where the clinician treats the highest number of Medicare patients. So it's aligned then with the hospital value-based purchasing program. Um, for individuals, they must perform at least 75% of their services in an inpatient or ER and group 75% of those clinicians meeting that criteria. So I'm going to talk a little bit about an, an example of a critical access hospital. Of, let's say your hospital has 25 clinicians that have reassigned their Medicare Part B professional services to the hospital's tax ID number. <clears throat> 
The NPI lookup on qpp.cms.gov shows that 14 exceed the low volume threshold and are MIPS eligible as individuals. Several of those clinicians who met the low volume threshold are non-patient facing and have less than 100 Medicare billable visits. So just, you know, as an example of what a, your hospital might be looking at, are these are the clinicians that you might have eligible for MIPS. Physicians who, let's say they work in a rural health clinic, but they come to your hospital to do colonoscopies, and they have reassigned their colonoscopies to be charged under your tax ID number. So those physicians would be eligible um, um, if they go above the threshold. And in this particular example, only one of those five physicians met the low volume exceeded the low volume threshold. Um, two out of the four CRNAs um, exceeded. Two out of the three physicians um, because they did outpatient surgical procedures in the hospital um, or billing to the hospital tax ID number. Um, this hospital has a couple specialists, urology and cardiology, who exceed the low volume threshold, and a pathologist. Um, however, this pathologist is non-patient facing, so he did not. Um, have any billable visits, and then five out of ten ER providers, um, including your agency locums providers, who've reassigned their Part B benefits. Um, so when you look at this list, what, and maybe yours is similar, a little different, um, but those are the things that you need to look at: is what type of providers do you have, and you know, are they MIPS eligible? Could are they billing to your tax ID number? So one thing to consider is: are they eligible for special scoring standard for um, ACI or improvement activities, if they're rural, small, or other special status, and then should they report as a group or individuals. So I'm going to kind of I'm going to come back to that example in just a little bit. I think this slide was out of order, and I apologize for that. So in the interim final rule for 2017. Extends the transition year hardship exception reweighting for ACI category to now include all three performance categories, um, not just ACI. So it includes um, for this interim the quality, cost, and improvement activities if um, the, in, in extreme and uncontrollable circumstances. Um, those clinicians are automatically exempt in 2017. And um, there is no need to submit hardship exemption application. These ECs automatically receive final MIPS score of 15 points, which is neutral. But if you submit data, it is scored. And the hardship exception does not apply for those who are in APM. Stop for questions if anyone has questions. I don't see any in the chat box. If anyone is dialed into the phone line, you can press star 2 to unmute your call. I think you can just continue on, Lisa. So thank you. Um, the steps to success in the quality payment program then is, is first, who are your eligible clinicians? And as we looked at that slide from previously, um, then determining what path are you? Are you in MIPS path? Or are you in an APM path? Um, and then after you determine that, you start collecting your data, advancing care information, quality measures, and improvement activities. What do you do with that data? Um, so we, we re, you really want to look at what is your current performance this year, um, from last year, I mean. And we really want to have you foster your performance improvement um, and choose your reporting method for ACI and improvement activity is either 90 to 365 days. Um, can, you can do a full calendar year. You must do a full calendar year for quality reporting and cost is a full calendar year. So. Um, if you're not sure of your reporting periods for 2018, don't worry. You still have time to choose that. You can um, evaluate your available reporting methods. 
um, using um, some tools that I will show you in a minute, and then choose your group or individual performance. You really don't need to choose group or individual performance until you report next, um, when you're reporting. And right now the reporting window is open as of January 2nd through March 31st for 2017 reporting. So one of the tools that we are very proud of at Stratus Health is the Stratus Health MIPS Estimator. Um, this is a very simple to use educational interactive tool um, that you register and log into. It's available free of charge um, to anyone who wants to um, use it. So it's educational, interactive. It has a lot of links to CMS and other resources throughout the tool if you're stuck. So we just included a lot of links. Um, and you can either, when you log on to the web page, you can look at an example report or create an account. This is a mock-up of the scoring results. And this is basically after you fill in all the categories. I've abbreviated this um, presentation to just show you the, the, the end results more. Um, the, the scoring results mock-up, uh, remember this scale. Um, when you're done reporting all of your method, this, uh, this particular uh, method um, chosen was EHR reporting. So as you can see, choosing the EHR um, method, um, I scored 82 points. But in registry, I scored 83 points. And in claims, I scored 56 points. And using a QCDR, it uh, should be the same as the registry, because they're scored the same. So it compares those scores across various reporting methods. And also compares your score um, to each other and to a group performance. So in my final score is 82. Um, Candy is 91.2, and Eric is 76.55. And then as a group together, though, we scored 84.95 points. So that tells me that Eric, you know, be better off scoring, um, scoring his as a with a group where uh, Candy has a little higher score, she could report as uh, with the group and also report as an individual to get that higher rating. This um, is the final um, breakdown of how each MIPS performance category contributes to your score. So in this, you can see that uh, the improvement activities, you base score of 40 is earned out of um, 40, so you got 100% of your 15 points. Advancing care information, 80 um, plus 15 bonus points is 95 out of 100. Um, so out of 25 MIPS points, you earn 23.75. Quality, 38 plus 8 bonus points would be 46 out of uh, 60 points, giving you 77% of your 60 category. Um, percentage points, 46 MIPS points, to earn a total estimated MIPS score of 84.95, which really falls really nicely in that, um, in that dashboard. From this screen, you can also um, print your results, download your results, save your results to um, compare to later, and review all your saved reports. There are some additional resources and tools available. Um, this is the, your, your site to go to, um, qpp.cms.gov. When you first sign into this website, this is where you want to check your participation status of all your NPIs within your um, organization. And it will tell you um, whether that NPI is um, eligible to report as an individual and as a group. And it will also show you every um, tax ID number that that MPI number provider is associated with. Stratus Health has some resources um, for QPP technical assistance for practices over 15 and 15 and under. Um, so we hold um, CMS contracts for both um, um, supports through CMS. And we have. Um, I'm sorry, we shouldn't have the Excel. We did release this as an Excel version early on, but we only have the online version available, which is much easier and much simpler to use. So we hope you enjoy it. We hope you try it. And to give yourself a chance to see how your MIPS score 
is doing and how you can um, perform. That concludes my presentation for today. I'm open for questions um, and a Q&A session. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. If anyone has any questions for Lisa today, you can type your question into the chat box, or if you're on the phone line, press star 2 to unmute your line. The slides for today uh, will be on the playbacks page. So if you if you would like to contact Lisa after this, if you have a question after this webinar, um, you can certainly send that to me, uh, or you can contact Lisa. Her um, contact information is in her slides.